Hi, this is Tony B from Black Box TV, and you're watching Behind the Reel. Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Reel. I've got a special treat for you guys today. I've got a live Skype interview with me, Tony V, from Black Box TV. Black Box TV is home to the best scripted sci-fi and horror content on YouTube, and they've also started doing pranks as of last year, which are quite hilarious, I might add. There's no better director or storyteller on YouTube, so let's jump right into that interview with Tony V and unlock the dark corners of his mind. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Andy. Good to see you again. Our readers love getting good advice. What are some best practices you could give to marketers and creators in general for how to make online video? Um, I think the number one thing is make something that's true to yourself. Uh, we all have our own unique voices. And if you want your voice to stand out, I think the best way is to find something that's close to you and something that you believe in, um, because that will help you. That'll help sort of um, give you something special to add. Uh, to online entertainment and to the online community, I think pair, I think just sort of trying to copy something is definitely not the way to go. Speaking of being true to yourself, this year you did pranks, black box TV style. You scared the crap out of people with your pranks in a, in a disturbing <laughs> way. <laughs> I like a like funny way, like a disturbing way, <laughs> like like zombies coming out of the ground to a lawnmower guy, right? No, 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 no. no. Do you see the prank trend continuing this year? I mean, they were so huge on YouTube last year. You know, it's it's really interesting because for us it was, for us it was something that we just did on April Fools. We just wanted to do something special. Uh, with Black Box TV, you have a channel that you can constantly populate with different kinds of content, and so for me, I was like, oh, let's do that. Um, and so I, it was really, really fun when it blew up. It definitely was something very different for Black Box TV, known for mostly our scripted, our scripted. Um, our scripted dramas, horror, uh, uh, sort of shorts, but it was really nice to see that the audience wanted more than anything to be entertained. And so for me, for me, the amount, uh, the amount of, of time that we have to spend on a prank is, is it's such a quick shoot. The ideas come so quickly because a lot of times they just end up being like scenes from black box TV episodes of uh, scripts that were never produced. So I'm like, Ooh, okay, let's, Let's, let's do that scene IRL. I don't want to anymore. Oh, 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 I think that the pranks will definitely continue um, on my channel at least. Um, and I also know that the, the trend as far as prank videos on YouTube is, is growing, which is interesting because I think a lot of the trends sort of come and go. Um, but I think, I think pranks really lend themselves uh, to short form content in the way that the setup is so quick. And um, I like that every time we do one, we're risking so much because it's, it's that, that, I hate that I'm saying that, but I like the fact that when you do a prank, um, you don't know uh, which way it's going to go. And as a director, it's really fun that you're sort of turning over the reins uh, to the people in front of the camera and hoping for the best. And, and, we, and we do end up with a lot of stuff that we can't use because um, it, it sounds funny, but, you know, I live in L.A., so, so people, people, the way that they react to the the, the way that people react to pranks in Los Angeles is, I think, different than anywhere else. Because in L.A., a lot of times people are just like, oh, it's a camera. Oh, <laughs> okay, I'll get them away. I'm late for work. Um, the ones that we shoot on the East Coast are my favorite. Um, uh, I think I think Stefan uh, is such a great director, and he handles those so well. And I think New Yorkers are just not used to it. So we get a lot of good stuff from there. You're on Black Box TV. <laughs> off, man. What are you talking about? Right? So aside from your YouTube ad revenue, what ways have you gone to find to sustain the Black Box TV brand and channel? It's interesting because, you know, uh, monetization, monetization is something that everybody works on and looks for and, let's be honest, just struggles with. Um, and and for, us, for us, we've always been doing so many different things. Uh, sometimes we're producing content for other channels. Sometimes we're um, working on projects for stuff off YouTube. My goal on YouTube was never to monetize the content because in the beginning when I started, you couldn't actually monetize it. There was no partner program yet. Um, it was to get my work out there and then maybe somebody would notice it and let me write a script or direct something. Um, the fact that like I just directed my first film last year based upon somebody who found something I did on YouTube and said, hey, I want to, you know, I want to produce this guy's movie. I mean, that for me is like mission accomplished. Who wants cookies? I will never let you leave Silverwood without me. I think if you do scripted content especially, and which is more expensive, 
than sort of like, you know, first person vlogs. I think your goal can't be that you're going to get like 10 million views on your 60 minute webisode. Um, the goal, the goal should be that you get your work out there and that people become aware of you um, and, and sort of your vision. And I think for me, that's how I've always used YouTube. So I feel very like grateful and lucky that it worked. That's awesome. Black Box TV was part of the original group of premium branded content on YouTube. Was that a good thing for the channel? Did you find that to be a beneficial experience? I think it, I think it was awesome because it put me like it put me in the ring with a lot of with a lot of amazing creators and writers and directors and actors and I had a lot more access to to um, to talent and to resources than I'd ever had. Um, which was so cool because you have to go through that process. Like there's this sort of you have to go through the process if you if you if you want to work on bigger budget stuff to work inside of the arena uh, uh, with with others with others who are doing the same thing. And and there was like there's such positives about it. Um, I got to work with actors that I've, I've I got to work with really good actors and people um, who I've admired for a long time. It was really interesting for me when I when I used to work. Um, when I used to work as a commercial artist, I used to design key art and stuff like that. I was um, I used to do uh, key art designs, which is the the posters that they use for promotion. And, and one of the shows that I I worked on was CSI. And so I would I was about 20 people removed, if not more, from Anthony Zeiker. So to actually be partnering with him and and be in the room talking about shows and concepts and scripts, uh, that was like it was very surreal. Actually, I think I think that's the number one thing that I took away from that experience is things can get very surreal very quickly. Um, and at the same time, it also showed me that like bigger uh, sort of my goals now are not necessarily like bigger partnership as much as strategic partnership. And for me, what that means is people who are in the space doing like-minded things. So that whether that's whether that's a, a director in Portland, like a guy who's doing an episode now for Black Box TV, or like with an awesome guy like Kevin Abrams, who was the EP for Velisca. Um, here's here's a guy who's done a ton of stuff, and and we're doing uh, we're working on the script and doing some rewrites till like four o'clock in the morning, uh, four nights in a row, and because he's so committed to making something great, and I think that's for me like those are the people that I want to work with more than anything. Working with Anthony and Dare to Pass and the Collective, like that was that was a really profound experience for me. Um, and it was it was a um, it was like it was it was time. It was time for me to grow and to be in that space. Uh, but only so that I could also know what I didn't want to do. Speaking of goals, you finally got your first movie in production. Gonna be finished very soon here. What other unfinished goals are on the horizon for you? I, I wrote my first script when I was um, six or seven years old. And I was storyboarding uh, uh, Super Friends episodes when I was a kid. So it's kind of like, I'm definitely at that point where I'm like, oh yeah, so what do you do next? Um, I, I think the, I think we're developing a couple of television shows right now. And um, one of them I love a lot. I think it, it may sound strange coming from me, but I really think that reality, um, Programming is is sort of a, a place I want I want is, is a is a sort of a new sandbox I want to play in because wow. as we understand oh well, let me explain why because oh my. Yeah. <laughs> the black box TV haunted house <laughs> but exactly I mean we understand the language of reality television we know the rules of the culture we know the rules we know we know um, we. Uh, we know that the sort of the, we, we understand the art form very clearly and there's all kinds of versions of it um that are like you know you still have your big brother thing you've got your like duck dynasty thing you have all this this understanding of what it means and so for me the shows that some of the shows i'm working for um both for black box and off of black box are are taking those to the next level and um I'm very excited about the potential of showing people a new type of reality programming um, now that we're able to take our audiences there. Well, you're excited about that, but your fans are excited about Velisco. When is when are they going to get a look? When is it going to be in front of their faces? 
Yeah, so Velisca is looking at, um, we're, we're, we're shooting for a Halloween release or October release of this year. Um, we're, I know, right, we're in, uh, we're in post right now. We should be finished by, like, um, early spring. Um, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's, it's like nothing I've ever done before, Andy, and it is, it is, uh, it was the scariest thing I ever worked on. <laughs> well, for the people um, who don't know what Velisca is, could you give a, a brief uh, description? Sure. So Velisca is a small town in Iowa in 1912. There were eight people killed in a house by a very angry, unknown to this day man uh, wielding an axe. And he used the blunt side of an axe to kill all these people. And I and for me, uh, for me, Black Box TV's relationship with Velisca started in uh, 2010 when I when I just told you know I asked my audience I was like I want to go to the scariest place in the United States and um, and there was a bunch of votes for this this unknown this story I didn't know about which is the Velisca axe murders from 1912 and so we went and stayed in the house where the murders happened and um, and I had my first brush with like you know, things that up until that point I didn't believe in. Was that, was that your scariest moment? Because you've visited a lot of places. That was my scariest moment. I think the man raised the castle in Washington uh, with Onision, that was really disturbing. Um, and the movie, it's interesting because it combines, it combines the, what happened to us in Villisca that night with all these sort of little beats um, from some of the other places that we've stayed at over the last three and a half years. So it's kind of, it's, in, it's interesting because there's a, there's a hope Andy for me with this film that I concisely explain my belief about like horror movies and supernatural endeavors. <laughs> Do you ever think you're tempting the spirit world way too much with what you're doing? I mean, like, you, went into, where, where, you were in the oven, right? That was the oven people were cooked in and you went and like slept in it. <laughs> you do your research. Um, no, I crawl into I crawl into the crematorium inside Linda Vista. I mean, the thing for me was was you get to a certain point in your life where you're like, okay, I get it. I get what the world's about. And you and and what happens after that is that you start thinking, well, what about those things I've avoided and and or those scare <laughs> me, you know? And you start to and you start to sort of. For me, for me, it was weird with because Black Box started off very much like sort of a Ray Bradbury, Twilight Zone um, influence kind of thing, and it we fell into all of this stuff. Like we, I, I could sort of, I, I very much understand now looking back that I didn't really have a conscious desire to explore the supernatural or a conscious desire to to make supernatural content, I kind of tripped and fell into it. And after Velisca, like, Velisca changed the way I look at the world um, because I was very much, I was very much a doubter and I didn't believe. And, and, and such significant things happened from Velisca to when we were working on Silverwood and the things that happened during production there. There was both dark and light outside of our experience. And that's not something I was prepared to learn. And uh, Velisca is is such an interesting project because it, the name of the movie is Velisca, it's the town, et cetera. But for me, it, it sort of encompasses this experience on black box TV where I sort of tripped and fell into the dark and found out that, you know, if you, if you, if you sort of seek out those things, um, they'll come and say hi. I'm, I'm still a skeptic, but your videos make me afraid to stay a night with you anywhere that could potentially be spooky. I just gonna say it. Dude, you should be a skeptic. I mean, you should be a skeptic. I don't think people should, I don't think people should be like, because there's people who feed into it, you know, that they're like, oh my God, there's, you know, I, did you hear that noise? Did you hear that noise? Yeah, that's your, you know, that's the old pipes in the house, or that's the wood floor in the house, or that's, a, you know, there's all these, these real reasons. But, I mean, in working on posts on the movie, like, there's certain moments where, like, there's a policy now, I think this is how cheesy it gets, Andy, but there's a sort of policy now with posts is that I won't edit, um, I won't edit or or work at, or work with anybody in post after midnight just because it's like, it just it just it gets too much because a lot of the stuff in Velisca is a, a true story. There's our fiction we fictionalized the characters um, because I didn't want I didn't want to go back into that house with uh, alone. I didn't want to go back in the house alone. Um, <laughs> 
wanted to go back into this experience with these fictional characters to sort of protect all of us uh, from getting too entrenched in the, you know, if you want to go see the, the, the doc that we did, it's on, Black, you know, it's on Black Box TV from 2010. I wanted to expand on what happened that night. And there's a big part of this for me, which is like, after this is done, I want this to be so amazing and be so succinct that I really, I want to turn my back on this paranormal world in some ways. Um, as much as I as much as I can, because uh, I found things there that I don't want to remember, and don't want to see again. Which is quite a far way to come from where you first started in the horror genre, making the joke movie short zombies on the station. So you've seen the rise of networks firsthand. You were part of that founding group that made Maker Studios, the station, and all that stuff. What would you say is the biggest lesson you you've learned of of the the dangers and what networks bring to YouTube? You know, I think I think the obvious answer the obvious answer is the one that you can read about on Twitter or look at on Tumblr or see in rant videos on YouTube, which is like you know, networks uh, aren't beneficial and um, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, I think I think I look at the, I look at networks as the same way um, I look at networks the same way that I look at um, anybody who's trying to create um, content on YouTube. It's all experimental. You know, I think everybody is trying different things to try to make a business model, to try to make it work for both creators and for producers. Um, and so I think that the networks have tried really hard to do that, and they're all following different business models. Some are, some are sort of the United Artists kind of idea. Some are, are like studios from 1930s, including like bad contracts and, and, and nefarious ways of getting people to be involved you know it's just like that we've, that movie is old it's 1930s hollywood like there's nothing new about it um and then there's the you know then there's like the heavy the ham-fisted um heavy-handed sort of like uh network approach which is like get as many as you can so that you can say that you're getting this you know trillion billion views uh i like trillion billion as a number but um that you're that you're getting all of these views and try to make it more um try to make uh, YouTube more palatable for advertisers. Um, for me, I've, I've always just been like, have the least amount of overhead that you can, have the least amount of people uh, working on your team that you can. That way you can just afford to survive both, you know, both this, you know, the lean times and, and the times where somebody's like, here's money, you know. Um, because I, I think that I think there's a there's definitely for me a, a danger of things growing too quickly, um, because just as fast as things grow, that means if if that growth isn't natural and comes from you directly, then that growth is based upon in, 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 an influx of cash from other people, and the thing about that sort of VC funded growth is it also contracts just as quickly, because um, if you're not able to you know magically monetize in a very short amount of time and pay for your expensive productions, then the people who loaned you that money or funded you through VC funding, they want to know why and they want to have more control because they think that possibly they have a better solution than the one that you've come up with. And I've seen a lot of people lose their companies that way. So I've, I've always been very much about like, if you want to survive on YouTube or if you want to survive on the internet as a creator, you know, if, if, if it sounds like it's too good to be true, it probably is. And just hang out, you know, sustain in a way that you can that you can stay a part of the community and that you can also, you know, stay in business. So along those lines, would you say YouTube in its current form is a sustainable business model or is that uh, do you have to bring in things from the outside to become a successful business on YouTube? My goal has always been to produce the kind of content online that I want to see. And that's always been the goal. And so I've always done things. Um, that I'm looking for that people aren't necessarily doing. Uh, so I think I think as far as YouTube being a sustainable business, um, I've always come at I've always come at it from the approach of a director or an artist or a creator, and that's been my goal is to make cool shit, you know, and and to put that kind of uh, put that kind of stuff out there. So I think whether YouTube is a sustainable model or not, I think everybody. I, I think I question the, the idea of what sustainability is. Um, are you going to put out videos, um, you know, every single day that are only on hot button topics that you know people are searching for? 
uh, and then do daily shows and, and things like that. That if, if, if you want to be like the most popular kid in class, that's the way to go. You know, the way to go is to sort of chase those trends that are happening in the media and to produce something similar with your own take on it, but to produce something similar. Um, for, for me, that's, that is a financially sustainable model, but not a personally sustainable model. I would have, I would, I created Black Box because I wanted something that had a lot of uh, potential for growth and elasticity, and I was going to be able to create what I wanted under the moniker of something and change. It's like pranks are such a big change from the scripted stuff, but it was also a part of my personality that I got to explore, which was that. I mean, we would watch, we would watch. The pranks are the only thing that I've ever created where we're sitting there watching them and everybody's laughing. Dude, that was crazy, man. When he comes out, I got a freaking predator. I don't even know what the hell is going on. Legitimately sick. And everybody is just like, this is ridiculous. I can't believe it. And we're just like, oh, no. no, no, no. Go, go, you know, go on. And it's nice to explore that part of what I do. Um, and so I think, I think for me, uh, Black Box TV is not it's not the, the most sustainable uh, uh, type of channel on YouTube in the way that we make expensive content and we care a lot about what it looks like. Um, but for me as a creator, it is the only uh, sort of approach that I suggest for creators like me because you really want people to see your work and you want them to be excited about it. And, and I, I think that people only get excited about numbers when they're trying to market something, meaning like, you get you're getting you know million you're, you're getting tons of views. Who wants to talk to you? Advertisers. They want you to shill for their product. And and uh, for me, that's just not what I do. You know, um, I make my own stuff. Well, Tony, well, Tony thank you so thank much you. for being on the show. Any last words before you go? Yeah, just great talking to you. And and and. Um, yeah, great talking to you. And if there's creators or artists out there who just want to get their work out there, I totally feel for you. And I understand. It was a guy uh, working in his kitchen in a small little kitchen nook who was just, uh, I'd get, I, I'd finish my regular job at about seven o'clock and then I'd go to the liquor store and I'd get a six pack of Red Bull and I'd edit till four or five in the morning. And doing that day after day uh, for three months changed my life. And now I do what I love. Five for that. Five. <laughs> well, I hope you all enjoyed that interview as much as I did. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And I'll see you next time on Behind the Reel.